Let's give the Lord Jesus Christ a hand clap of praise. He's the only one worthy, isn't he? Amen. We love you, Jesus. Glory be to God. He's faithful. While you're standing, turn around and look somebody dead in the eye and tell them only if you believe it. Say, today is my day for a miracle. And now you can get, let them in on the secret. Say, today is your day too. <laughs> Glory to God. What an atmosphere. This is the atmosphere where miracles take place. Amen. You don't have to work this crowd, that's for sure. Amen. I'm thankful for King of Kings. He's exalted in this house. And I thank God for your pastors. I had a chance to be with Pastor Pete and Pastor Tr Trish last night. And what a time of fellowship we had. Awesome. So thankful for this witness in this community and in this part of the world. You know, I lived in New York City for nine years. In fact, one of my friend, dear friends came to see me. Evelyn, so good to see you. Thank you for coming over. I haven't been, seen you but 30-some years, maybe? It's been a while. 25, has it been? Wow. And then, Brother Addison, where'd you land? Where'd you? There you are. He and I talked on the phone, like, about, what, two or three weeks ago, and he reminded me that we were together as children in the original Miracle Temple in Newark, New Jersey. He still pastors there, and I just am honored that you're here with me. They're actually going to have a Miracle Temple reunion coming up the end of April, is it? Yes. And so I was hoping I'd get there. There's so many things going on, but I'm just so happy to be here. I know the Lord has some wonderful things in store for us. Let me just take care of business, and then I'll get on with it. I brought with me uh, a book that I put together last year. Actually, Sid Roth, that struggling TV evangelist, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he invited me to be on his program, and he encouraged me to do a book. He said, what do you have? Because we need to get something quick. And I said, well, I've got my dad's book on miracles. You know, he loved to tell miracle stories. You ever heard my dad on the radio? He loved to tell miracle stories. And so I had a book of his classics, and he says, well, Donna, you know, people, they really want to know how do they have miracles happen through their own life. And he said, I, I challenge you to write your side of the story and take those miracle stories and tell how you observed uh, the anointing for miracles in your father's own life and how it developed in your life. And that's exactly what I did. And I call it the anointing for miracles but really, it has a practical step-by-step -step outline of some things that are, are very biblical, very straightforward that I saw in my dad's life. Anybody who knew him, anybody who rubbed shoulders with him knew that compassion was something that flowed out of his heart. He, he had a genuine love for people, but it was a supernatural love. It was a compassion that he would stay for hours upon hours, night after night, loving people to wholeness and deliverance. He'd hug them, lay hands on them. We had to drag him out, even, even to his dying day, he was doing that. And uh, I just want to tell you, for those of you who know him and love him, the last place he spoke publicly was in Denver. And I, I almost, I, I, I thought I lost my mind for sending him there because he had breathing issues. And, you know, that's the Mile High City. And so he got altitude sickness when he was out there. And my nephew had to practically carry him to the platform to preach. He was 84 years of age, going on 85. And it was about six months before he passed away. And my, uh, my nephew told me, he said, Donna, he was bent over. He could hardly read his message. Uh, he was really fatigued. And my nephew was worried about him. But he said, when he gave the altar call <laughs> in a church in Denver that's known for faith, 500 people, 500 people came to the Lord. 
in that last service. So listen, I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter how you feel physically. It doesn't matter what you look like. The anointing of God supersedes everything in the natural. The anointing of God is supernatural. We've got to learn how to look past that. Hallelujah. And draw what we need for, from the Lord. And then I, I'm, I'm offering that book with something that I feel like is a, a little known secret in our ministry. My dad, we had him sit down and just read scripture. We didn't have time for him to read the whole Bible, but I said, Dad, you know that all the scriptures on healing, your voice alone carries with it an anointing, you know. So he read all of these healing scriptures, and while he was in there, he had to give, you know, his editorial comment on them. And um, we just, we recommend people who are battling a sickness or a disease, just play this over and over again, you know, in the bedroom, in the hospital room, in the car, whatever it is, and that's a blessing to you. You can buy them individually for $15 each, but the package we're, we're specialing today for 20 Somebody say, that's a blessing. And I'm going to give that to you, Pastor. Thank you for both of you. All right, I'm going to uh, preach on putting a demand on the anointing, but before I do... Uh, last night, I'm not much of a dreamer, <laughs> but last night in the middle of the night, uh, I had one of those weird wake you up out of bed kind of dreams, and I knew it was the Lord uh, that was trying to speak to my spirit, and I'm not going to tell you the details of it because it was personal to me, but um, I, I want to say this to you, when God's getting ready to do something new, in our lives, there has to come a closed door behind us. There has to come an end of a thing. We can't have a new beginning unless we're willing to turn around and shut the door on the past. And I feel as though the Lord is saying that there are some here today, and I know he was speaking to my heart, that have had some emotional ties maybe even some soul ties to something that they have not wanted to let go of. They know they should. They know it's not healthy for them. They know it's not good for them. And God is saying, it's time to shut the door. That thing, it's time. These are the words I heard in my dream. This thing has to die. And so if that is for you, I want you if, you, if you feel like that word was for you, would you just lift your hand right now and say there's some things that have to die? Okay, now lift the other hand. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we're sitting here attentive to your word, we thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability to hear and to understand, but you also give us the ability, Father, to do and to accomplish. And so with those that have their hands raised, I say, Lord, I allow you to put to death Lord God, everything that is not going to contribute to this new day that you have released in our lives, anything that is holding us back, God, we shut the door on every weight, every hindrance, Lord God, and I take authority over every hindering spirit that would try to dominate our thinking and tell us that we need it. God, we speak clarity over every mind, every, every heart. Lord, and a determination of will to say, I am pressing through to the new thing. I am not going to consider the old thing. I'm going to forget those things that are behind, and I'm going to press forward, God, with everything within me, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. If you agreed that it's done, say amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, some of you have come today for a miracle. And as I said, this is a miracle day. I believe God's going to do some outstanding things. But anyone who ever received a miracle from God came to Jesus ready. Came to Jesus determined to receive in their heart something from him. You know, oftentimes within church, I, I've seen it. You can tell the difference between somebody who's going to receive a miracle and somebody who's just hoping to. Because in our culture, we have made church something of a spectator sport. <laughs> 
People have come to see what's going to happen. What's the preacher going to do? What's the preacher going to say? How's the preacher going to make this miracle happen? Well, darling, the preacher is just called to give a message. The preacher is not your savior. The preacher is not your miracle worker. But every time you come into the presence of God with the joint faith of other believers, you should come expecting, hallelujah, come looking for what Jesus is going to do. We have to have a hunger and a determination. If our eyes are on men, we're going to be failed every single time. But if we learn how to look for what Jesus is doing and listen to his word, then we will receive. Those that came to Jesus also may have had some questions, and questions are okay. Questions don't necessarily mean doubt. Questions mean that we're still trying to figure out how God's going to do it. But there was something that was different about people that approached Jesus with faith is they knew Jesus had the answer to their question. And so we don't have to find that answer in ourselves. We just have to keep walking toward Jesus. Jesus, I don't understand how you're going to do it. I don't know if you're going to hit me with a lightning bolt. I don't know if I'm going to feel fire on the inside. I don't know if I'm going to fall on the floor or I'll get a prophetic word. I don't care how you do it, but I know that you are going to bring the answer. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to talk about three women today if we get through it. And my dad used to say, it, it's always a woman. <laughs> he loved when women had faith. He th felt like they were the most tenacious. But there are three women that put a demand on Jesus. And I want to start with Mary, the mother of Jesus. The story is from John chapter 2. And you know the story, the, the uh, wedding at Cana. And the Bible says that Jesus and the disciples were invited to this wedding. They were not invited to preach. They were not invited to present the kingdom. They were just hanging out as guests in a wedding. And you know the story that the, they ran out of wine. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, she didn't pray for wine and she didn't tell Jesus what to do. But she just made the issue known to him. And she said, hey, Jesus, they, they ran out of wine. And Jesus knew. I mean, we know our moms. We know people. <laughs> and he knew what he, she was kind of hinting to. He said, woman, what is that to me? That's, that's none of my concern. And my time hasn't come yet. He knew she wanted a miracle. She was putting a demand on that anointing. Now, she didn't contradict him. She honored his role. But she just went to somebody else. She just went to the servants and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She was preparing for the miracle. And the only way that she knew, she just kept moving looking, doing what she could do because she knew her son. Hallelujah. He knew her, but she knew him. She made an, a need known, and he knew how to take care of it. Amen? I love this story because it's kind of an unusual story. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, neither Mary nor Jesus prayed for this miracle. And as you analyze this miracle, it's all about action. You know, Mary said, whatever he says, do it. And Jesus said, okay, take those water pots. You know the ones where they wash their feet at the door? Yeah. The yucky water? Yeah. I dare you. I can hear him saying, I dare you. Take that water to the, to the steward of the feast. I dare you. Of course, I'm just adding to the scripture a little bit, you know. And he said, take it and ladle it out. Give him something to drink. Now, he didn't pray over that water. He didn't say, in the name above every other name. He didn't pre preach in tongues, did he? he? Didn't make the sign of the cross. Didn't anoint it with oil. Didn't do any of that. He just said, pour out the water. 
And in obedience to Jesus, they poured out the water. And it was in the action, it was in the obedience that the miracle took place. Hallelujah. That, that man took one sip of that water and he goes, mm, why did you save the best wine to last? Hallelujah. And this is what we have to understand. Sometimes when it comes to receiving a miracle, we feel like we have to convince Jesus to do something. We feel like we have to twist his arm. We feel like we have to tell him how to do it. Sometimes we feel like we have to be all religious and do some religious thing to make it happen. We got to do some type of arm circle or, you know, make the sign of the cross three times or whatever it is. But I'm here to tell you, all we have to do is say, Jesus, I have a need and I know who you are. I'm putting a demand on the anointing today and whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. Hallelujah. And that's what we have to understand, that God is looking for our participation in a miracle. When he tells us to, to walk towards something, we've got we to gotta stretch out our faith. I remember... When I was uh, about five or six years ago, I had a frozen shoulder. I couldn't move it any higher than about here. Couldn't do this with it. Couldn't move it around. And I was frustrated with it because I needed, it was my right arm. And I needed to be able to move it. So I went to a physical therapist, and they worked on it for about three months, and it seemed to get worse. And I was just getting mad. And so I heard that there was a healing meeting coming to Oklahoma City. And I knew that this man got miracles. So I said, I'm going to get healed. I knew I was going to get healed. I was determined to go and get healed. I drove five hours to go and get healed. I sat on the front row. The man didn't preach that good. <laughs> Wasn't about the preaching because I knew there was an anointing for healing. See, I knew how to, to watch. And sure enough, when he got up there and began to lead the worship, and people began to acknowledge the King of Kings, I said, here it comes. <laughs> Here it comes. Here comes that healing wave. And I just began to try to move that arm. Nobody knew what I was doing. I just began to. I knew that the healer was in the house. And I just began to move that arm. Well, you know, I still couldn't lift it when I left. And I, I, didn't, I didn't fear. I didn't doubt. I just knew I had an experience with the healer. Everybody say two days later. Two days later, I was in my bathroom, and I was just hurrying to get dressed for work. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I lifted my brush and just brushed my hair. And, you know, I was kind of kind of halfway thinking, you know, uh, what am I going to do at work? And then I realized, hey, wait, that's the wrong arm. I'm not supposed to be able to do that. Wait, ho, whoa, whoa, look at that. Look, I'm healed by a stripes. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you is sometimes we wait for our rational mind to figure out when the miracle's going to take place or how it's going to take place. All we have to do is say, Jesus, I know you're the miracle worker. I know you've got something for me, and I'm going to praise you right here until it moves your hand. I am the healed of the Lord because I dare to say so. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. What I'm trying to tell you is this. How we come to church, how we approach Jesus makes a difference. And I've had an apple out of both. I come to church just kind of, well, I hope somebody says something that moves me today. Really need a faith lift today. Really don't even feel like getting out of bed because, you know, I had a hard, hard, hard old week. Been a rough week. But God, you see, faithful. Faithful. Yeah, I don't even have to sing today. You know, Lord, it's not about works. It's not about works, God. Get all religious, right? 
Would that that man, does he think he's going to receive anything of the Lord? But what we can come in and say, Lord, yeah, I've had a rough week, but things are about to get better. <laughs> I'm coming into the house of God. I'm coming into the place where the Lord dwells in the midst of his people. Hallelujah. We're going to praise him. We're going to shout. We're going to work, Lord God, in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to get a word. I'm going to get a touch. I'm going to feel the fire of God. I thank you, God, that today is my day. And when we begin to approach him, with faith, that's when the miracle begins released. Do you know you can release a miracle for somebody else with your praise? It's electrifying. I came in here and just sat down. I didn't know any of you, but just the sound of your voices, the intensity of your worship, honey, something began to rumble on the inside of me, right? That river of living water, it just begins to flow every time you begin to sing praises to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Come on, turn to somebody say, put a demand on the anointing. Oh, glory to God. Woman number two. Let's read today from Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48. This is the woman with the issue of blood. We know the story. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now I love this story because it's such a visual of what I'm talking about when we put a demand on the anointing. When that woman touched the hem of his garment, you know, that priestly robe, the, the, the tassels at the bottom, that she grabbed a hold of, Jesus literally felt virtue go out from him. And he felt it uh, that there was a strength that went out. He didn't see who was because everybody was surrounding him. And, and I want you to know that there are some times, you know, we need to look and understand that when we feel, you know, this may all be new to you, you may feel, even while I'm preaching, you may feel a strengthening coming into your body. You may feel that your faith beginning to rise or your heart beginning to accept that Jesus is here to touch you and heal you. Some people feel a heat. They feel a fire begin to burn like if they had arthritis maybe in their knees or, or maybe they feel it in their chest where they need a miracle in their lungs. Well, when you start feeling things like that, just start lifting your hands and say, thank you, Lord, for my healing. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't happen the same way for everybody. There might be some that feel a wind that blows on them. But Jesus literally felt in his flesh that something went out from him. Those of us who've ministered to people who are sick, we know what this feels like. We know that issue of power that comes when the anointing is flowing through us. I remember I was in Canada. And... Uh, I had, we had had a long flight, and, and it was bitter cold. We were in Winnipeg, Canada, and I had to get on these tiny little planes. And, and I remember the first night of, of my service there, I had pain all throughout my body, my shoulders, my elbows, my knees, and I, it was unusual for me. I thought, well, maybe it was just that cold plane I was in. And I, I spoke to the lady that was traveling with me. I said, just pray that I'll be able to walk to the podium. It's unusual. And when I stood at the podium, 
I couldn't get two words out because I felt a shaft of the glory of God just begin to rain. And all I could do was lift my hands and worship God. All I could do was worship. I couldn't even speak. And instantly that pain began to leave my body. And the people of God just began to worship. It was a mighty move of God. Well, that night when we began to lay hands on people, I just moved down the road and touched them. I really didn't know what, what everybody was doing. But there was this one lady. She had to practically crawl into the building. She couldn't walk. She, she uh, was, was kind of bent over, and her body was riddled with pain. And what I, the Lord let me understand is that I was feeling... <laughs> what she was feeling, and letting me, he was letting me know what he was about to do. I found it out after the effect, but the minute I touched her, didn't even know what was wrong with her, that pain instantly left her body, and she walked out of that place and came back the next night walking in, hallelujah, pain-free. See, we can't always explain the movings of God. And then there was a woman. I went to keep going down the line. There was a woman whose, whose hands were bent over like this. And all of a sudden, I just felt that unction. I felt that anointing leaving me. And my hands went up under her fingers. And her hands straightened right up. Hallelujah. So this is what I'm trying to tell you. There is a flow of the anointing for God to heal. And we have to be a people that understand that when we sense that move, when we sense that God is moving us direction, don't let anything hold us back. And I love the question that he asked. He said, who touched me? And, you know, all, all around him, everybody was bumping into him. So he wasn't talking. Listen, this is an important point. He wasn't talking about a physical touch, even though she touched him physically. Because when he felt that touch, there was a, a, a spiritual connection. And so we need to understand that the faith that we have connects us to the faith of Jesus. You know, yes, we can reach out with our hand. Yes, I can reach out to you. But really, it's not so much. That's a symbolic gesture. When I touch my sister or she grasps me, that's, that's symbolism. But what's really happening is spirit is talking to spirit. Amen? When you're standing here like that, you're saying, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to receive. When I put my hand out, I'm saying, I'm ready to impart. Hallelujah. I receive. I impart. Sometimes we're looking for everybody else to do it for us. But when you get hands laid on you, don't say, oh, i got a pain over here too. Can you touch me here? And then can you get me over here? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a chiropractor. I didn't come to give you a diagnosis. I just came to give you a deposit. Hallelujah. And when you stand, you say, I receive the healing virtue of Christ Jesus. It's a connection in the spirit. And the virtue of Christ will go out. Now, now here's something that I think is interesting. It's unfortunate that we all have to get into this place. But what scripture says about this woman was she was a very sick woman. She was so sick that nobody was able to help her. No doctor could help her. All her money was gone. Could I say it to you this way? She had no hope. It's unfortunate that oftentimes Jesus becomes the last choice rather than the first that we go to. It's unfortunate. But she was bleeding perpetually, bleeding to death. She was in a very desperate situation. I want you to think about this, and this is a kind of a delicate issue, but, you know, she was bleeding in a way that would be visible to people around her. Most women would understand that you don't want to be in public in that situation. You want to hide. You want to cover yourself up. But this is what desperation does. Desperation knows that Jesus is the only answer. 
And even if it meant I'm going to have to do something uncomfortable, I'm going to have to do something that might bring some temporary shame. I have to push past my pride. I have to push past my comfort level because I know if I don't touch Jesus, I'm not getting healed. And here's that woman bleeding and in a visual way, throwing herself at the foot of Jesus. Look, she was even risking her own life, risking possibly getting trampled to death, but she saw something in Jesus that other people didn't see and she drew out of Jesus a miracle that others didn't get hallelujah we've got to be a people that know how to put a demand on the anointing of God oh glory to God I was in Mexico City I think it was last year and we were praying I, I wasn't laying hands on people in Mexico City you know, you could be preaching to 5,000 people in one service. And, you know, it might have been an altar about with this much space. And people were crammed in halfway back to the building. So I could not get to be able to lay hands on them. And uh, I didn't find this out till later. But while we were praying and while that anointing was flowing, there was a man who had an idea. I didn't know it. I found it out two days later. But his mother, 99 years of age, was dying in a hospital. I think it was pneumonia. And the doctors were g giving her hours to live, not days, but hours to live. 99 years of age. And while that anointing was flowing, he got an idea. He picked up his cell phone and he called his sister. And he said, put the phone up to mama's ear. <laughs> And while I'm praying, he, he said, Mama, we're asking Jesus for a miracle right now. And I didn't even know what I was praying for. But there, I, I, it's not about me. It's not about our words. It's about the anointing of God. The, how many of you know the anointing can go through a cell phone? Yeah. She immediately got a touch from God, got up out of that bed, and was discharged that day from the hospital, 99 years of age and free of pneumonia, healed by the power of God because somebody put a demand on the anointing. What am I trying to tell you? It may look like a cell phone. It may look like a lunge. I don't know what it's going to look like for you, but when you feel the power of God being dispersed, your direction just run toward it and grab it and take what God has for you today come on lift your hands and give him praise hallelujah see if you're desperate enough you'll get to him oh I feel it this morning <laughs> I said if you're desperate enough you'll get to him You'll figure it out. We were in Costa Rica. <laughs> I've got so many Costa Rica stories. And I was in a healing meeting, and I didn't know all the miracles that took place, but one I couldn't help but see. There was a little woman. I mean, I, she was the first woman down, but she couldn't hardly walk. She was walking on a cane, and she was dragging a foot. And she was inching her way toward the front, but her face was had that determined look. Turn to somebody and say, it's always a woman. <laughs> she was coming the direction. And she looked kind of mad, but it was determination. She was going to get there. She was going to get there. And I looked at her and I said, what would you come for? She said, I came to get healed. <laughs> I said, that's the right answer. I put my hand on her. I didn't even know what was wrong with her. I touched her in her knee, touched her on her head, and I said, be healed in the name of Jesus. And I went on to the other 200 people. And when I came back, I saw some movement in the middle. You know how you can catch it out of the corner of your eye. And I looked. There that woman was dancing with the cane on her shoulder. Hallelujah. <laughs> she was, then she started to prance. Then she started to show off. 
She walked across the front and she was just strutting. She came for her miracle and it didn't take her long. She had an inch her way forward, but she drew a miracle out of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Can I tell you about the power of the anointing? I got to tell you this story. It's so good. I was in Costa Rica. We were trying to set up a crusade, and I was there six months early preaching in as many churches as I could get to in a week. And so that was about, I think I preached eight times that week, twice on the first Sunday, Monday night, Tuesday night. We might have missed one night. And by the time I got to the next Sunday, I didn't want to get out of bed. Can I be real with you? Sunday morning... My, I was brain dead, literally. My, my brain was mush. And I, I had, hardly had two words to say to the pastor. He said, coffee. I said, please. <laughs> <laughs> I got to the pulpit, and I said, dear Lord, have mercy. I said, if, if you'll just, I'll just open my mouth. You said you'd fill it. And that's what happened. And, man, people got saved and healed in that meeting, anointing. And then I had to go home, <laughs> change clothes, and run to the last meeting of the day, second meeting on a Sunday. I did not want to go to the next meeting. I said, Lord, is there any way you can get me out of this? And then the heavens burst open. And there was torrential downpour. I mean, it was one of those gully washers, like we say in Texas. And then the pastor showed up and said, we're coming in five minutes. I said, you mean they're still coming and all that rain? He said, oh, yeah, they're there. They're waiting for you. I said, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> so I got there. And the pastor of the church distraught. His name is Christian. Usually he's smiling from ear to ear. Oh, Sister Donna. Oh, Sister Donna. You gotta pray. You gotta pray. What happened? He said, you know that rain that you just came through? Yes. He said, seven families of mine live in cardboard houses. And seven of them lost their homes. They were just washed away by that water. And so I was saying, well, what are you gonna do? He says, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So here's the pastor distraught not knowing what he's going to do. Here's the evangelist, doesn't even want to be there. <laughs> you getting the picture? Okay. <laughs> Somebody say the anointing. the anointing. That's what you need. So I just got up and preached, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to get this over with quick. <laughs> preached, built the faith of the people, called for those that wanted to get saved, called for those that wanted to be healed. And because I didn't speak the language, I just kind of went down the line pretty quickly, touched them and believed. But I got to about here in the line. And just like Jesus said, I felt something go out of me into a man. I just felt it go. And I knew something happened. But I just kept going. Got on the bus. Next day I went home. The second day I got a call from Christian, Pastor Christian. Sister Donna, you're not going to believe this miracle. And I'm telling you this because a lot of times we think it's about the man or the woman. He says, there was a man that came for healing that night. And he had a stomach filled with tumors. Stage four cancer. He was given a week to live. But he came to get healed. And he said, when Sister Donna laid her hands on him, he felt fire go into his stomach. So he said, he came running to me, and he said, Pastor Christian, he said, I know God just healed me. And he said, I want to repent of my sins. He said, I've been living with a woman for four years. I want to get married. I don't want to live in sin anymore. And he said, will you come and marry us tomorrow? <laughs> it, was about 30, it was about 30 miles away. Pastor Christian said, I'll be there. And he walks into this... this uh, wedding party, and here the man is, but he was mad because there was about 150 family members and friends who came. Nobody brought him a wedding gift because they all thought he was going to die. They just came to say goodbye. They thought he was just having some type of, you know, 
sentimental thing going on. And he got mad at me. He said, Jesus healed me. And he said, wait right here. And he went to find the doctor that took the x-rays. And he said, Doc, I need x-rays right now. Right now, I need x-rays. The doc, what do you need x-rays? You're dying. He said, I want an x-ray now. I'll pay for them. And so the man took him in to get x-rays, and he was in there a long, long time. But finally, he came out with two, two sets of x-rays. He said, listen, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what happened. But he said, this is what your stomach looked like last week. He said, you see those tumors? You see the cancer? He said, this is what your stomach looks like now. He said, not only are the tumors gone, he says, you've got baby flesh in there. You've got a brand new stomach. <laughs> and he said, that's because Jesus healed me. Hallelujah. Oh, but that's not the best part of the story. He went back with those x-rays to his family members and friends. And he said, look what Jesus did. I told you I was healed. And Pastor Christian led them all to Jesus and planted a church right there in that town. I'm talking about the power of the anointing. It's not dependent on the evangelist. It's not dependent on the pastor. But it takes one who presses into Jesus and says, I'm putting a demand on Today is my day. If I don't get touched today, I will be healed. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> oh, get ready, get ready, get ready. I believe he's releasing it right now. Some of you are feeling it right now. Number three. Somebody say number three. It's always a woman. The reference is Matthew chapter 15, verses 22 to 28. It's the Syrophoenician woman. I used to love to hear my dad preach about her. <laughs> Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The disciples say, can't you shut that woman up? She's bothering us, Lord. So she shouted even louder, I said, Jesus, thou son of David, over here, Lord. <laughs> seemed like Jesus wasn't listening to her. In fact, it seemed like Jesus was dissing her. Because finally when he spoke up, he says, you know, I only came to the the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, I, I, it's not, you know, meat for me to give the children's bread to dogs. But she kept on asking. And she kept on moving toward him. And she kept on pushing past where others would have stopped. I'm going to talk about this for a minute because... There's a secret that, that, that some people have learned that Jesus has moved in a different way than human beings are moved. You know, J Jesus doesn't deal with us after the flesh. He deals with us after the spirit. We approach him oftentimes on the basis of the flesh. Oh, my pain. Oh, the disease. Oh, the doctor's report. Oh, I feel so bad, God. You know, here's Jesus telling her, you know, <laughs> You don't belong to the right tribe. You're just a little dog. A lot of people came to church and they heard the pastor talk like that. They'd be so out the back door quickly. And they'd never be back again. You know, there are people who are, live in their self-pity. There are people who live in their rejection. And this is one of the things that God wants to close the door on today. This is the one thing that God wants to end today. Forget about what your mother said to you 15 years ago. Forget about the guy that broke your heart. 
Forget about the one that doesn't love you anymore. Okay, you sang the sad song, you played the violin, you cried the tears. It's over. Somebody say, it's over. If you want the newness of God and you want the healing of God, let go of the pain, let go of the suffering, let go of the past, let go of the pity party. Say, I have come as one that Christ is going to look on today. I'm moving toward Jesus. I'm putting a demand on his anointing and I refuse to wallow in self-pity any longer. Hallelujah. He took my shame. He took my guilt. He hung naked on a cross. He took the stripes for my healing. He's done it all for me. I'm not going to live in shame. I'm not going to live in remorse. I'm not going to live in the past any longer because it's a completed work. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Praise Jesus. He did it. <laughs> He did it. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> we let the devil shut us down in our minds and our emotions. Somebody say something stupid to us. We can live in it for a week. But honey, it's time that army starts to understand it's not life as usual any longer. But we're going to learn how to take the tough stuff. We're going to learn how to get the thick skin. We're going to learn how to be resilient to the lies of the enemy. And we're going to stand up with the sword of the Lord in our hand. We're going to take the shield of faith above all. We'll quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. We're going to be a different breed, a new breed. Hallelujah. This is the day that we push back against the lies of the enemy. Come on, shout yes. Hallelujah. It's a day of release. <laughs> See, people come to church for a healing meeting. And I've seen it. They come uh, wanting you to feel sorry for them. I've been sick for so long. I've been hurting so bad. And I just pray Jesus wants to heal me. Honey, take it. He's here to heal you. Oh, I know, but you don't know how badly I hurt. Well, what's bigger, Jesus or your pain? See, what are you... What are you looking at the most are you looking at the symptoms or are you looking at Jesus you see and I know listen we're all susceptible to it all of us I understand I've been in pain I understand what that is but there comes a time when we have to make up our mind I don't care if this pain tries to debilitate me yet will I praise him You know, I love the part where Jesus told this woman it wasn't a good thing to give the children's bread to dogs because she didn't get offended. It's an unusual woman, by the way. <laughs> or man. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I was reading this the other day, and something, you know, you hear it 150,000 times. My dad preached it 175,000 times. And... I saw something for the very first time in the scripture. She said, yes, Lord. But even the puppies eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now, you know what she was saying? You're my master. She was identifying Jesus not just as Lord, but I'm taking you as my master. 
I recognize I might be a puppy in your household, but I still belong to you. You can kick me to the curb anytime you want to, but just give me a crumb or two, Lord. Because I know a crumb from you can take care of cancer in an instant. Hallelujah. I know what an anointed crumb from you can do. And Jesus was amazed at her faith. But it wasn't just that, that he had the power to heal her. She, being a Syrophoenician woman, was saying, I don't care if, if I'm in, not in your club, but I'm making you the Lord of my club. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm making you the master. I'm going to be the first in my city. I'm going to be the first of my tribe that says Jesus, the son of David, is my Lord and master. And when she understood and had revelation of who he was, Jesus said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. You got it, girl. Whatever you came for, it's already done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, that woman came for her daughter. Everybody thought she was making noise about herself, but her daughter was grievously vexed with the devil. And sometimes we don't know what's going on in the hearts of men and women. Right, right here in New Jersey, years and years ago, Brother Addison, do you remember Mother Velez? Mother Velez was that lady I was telling you about that used to, jump up and down like that. She wore a little pillbox hat. And uh, I can still see her. When she worshiped, she got excited, but her worship was jumping up and down. But one time, Dad was taking an offering for the building. They they're tried to pay for the building. And he had just met with her before the service. And she said, Brother Schambach, you need to agree with me that I'm able to pay my rent this month because I'm about, I think it was $200 short. She had $300 on her. And when dad got up to take the offering, the Lord spoke to her and said, give the $300 toward the building. And when dad saw her give it, he, said, he took the money and put it back in her hands. Because, you know, when you're pastor, it's a little different story than being an evangelist. He knew her situation. He said, no, honey, you need to save this for the rent. And she looked at him. She said, Brother Shambach, are you trying to cheat me out of my blessing? He backed up. She said, you didn't ask me for it. God did. He said, give it back. <laughs> she put that $300 in the offering. Now, what Dad didn't know is she was believing God for her two sons who were drug addicts to get saved, and she was sowing that offering for those two boys to get saved. And, you know, back in the day, they had services 21 days in a row. I mean, they, it was just perpetual revival. And I, he always said the next night. So if it wasn't the next night, I'm just quoting him, okay? But the next night, <laughs> he sees her sitting on the front row with two boys on the other side of her. And he just started to grin from ear to ear. He stopped the service. He said, hold it. I know there's a testimony here. Come here, mother. What happened? She said, Brother Shambach, you knew I gave that money in the offering. Yeah. She said, last night I got a knock on the door, and I got the surprise of my life. She said, there were my boys. They were out in the streets. And she said, the power of God hit them in the streets. She said, every taste for the drug left their body. And she said the conviction of the Holy Spirit fell on them. They came back to mama and they said, mama, we want to get right with God. We want to give our lives to Jesus. And they put money in her hand. And it was enough money to pay her rent for six months in the future. Hallelujah. That night they came to church with mama, gave their heart to the Lord. Hallelujah. It was a revolution in our family. This is what I'm trying to tell you. It may not make sense to the natural mind. God may tell you to do something that is an act of faith. But when you move toward Jesus and when you just do what he tells you to do, he will never disappoint you. He's an on-time God. Hallelujah. He's never too late. He just tells you what to do, and he, re he causes you to respond. Oh, come on. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got to tell you, and I want to thank everybody that's prayed for me. That's the first and foremost, because prayers do work. But I have been under a demonic attack like you would not believe. This is all demonic. God healed this knee 42 years ago. And now he's trying to take it. You know, God healed it. And when God heals something, it's a done deal. Amen. You know, so this is, this is all demonic. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Why don't you come up here right now? In the name of Jesus, stand up. In the Walk in Jesus' name. Receive. Pick up those knees and walk in Jesus' name. I am healed by his stripes. Reba Casile di Bondo Robo. Isha Kanduro Bobosita. If you're here to get your healing, I want you to come up in the name of Jesus. Get that thing out of here. <laughs> come on, just stand in the front. <laughs> Just stretch your hands up in the name of Jesus. Worship team, if you want to come, that's okay too. I'm going to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. But the anointing of God is so strong right here. I want to pray before I lay hands on you. I just want to pray. Just soak in that anointing a little bit. That's good. Oh, riba si keji. Hindi de handoroko. Ilena no boriki. Father, here we stand in the presence of the Holy One. <laughs> Father, we sense the anointing of God so strongly right now. And Lord, we're here to put a demand on you, Father. We're here to hear your voice, God, and we're listening today. Whatever you say to us, we're going to do it, Father. And right now, Lord, in the presence of your company of angels, hallelujah, I take authority over every demon spirit of infirmity, every spirit of bondage, every spirit of self-pity, every lying spirit, every spirit of confusion. And I say, be gone in Jesus' name. You are trespassing on God's property. Called Ribandu Kusuku. I break it. I break that thing in Jesus' name. I break it in the name of Jesus. I say be free by the authority of Christ Jesus. Robo kosile. Shile bando robo kurine. Come on, worship him. Worship him. Risikire kandoro. It's like you, Lord, in all the earth. Oh, matchless love, matchless love, and beauty, and this world. Nothing in this world could satisfy. Nothing. 
nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence. Your presence is to me. Your presence is Do that again. Who is like you? Who is like you, Lord, in all you? Nobody like you. Matchless love. Matchless love and beauty and this world. Nothing in this world. Nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup. Jesus, you're the cup. We won't run dry. Treasure of my heart, treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, you are merciful. Ruler of my past and present wrong. You're the holder of my future days. Come on, sing it out. Oh, Lord, your presence, Lord, in heaven to me. See that little tag on the end of chorus 1B? Your presence is Say, oh, Jesus. Come on, you can sing it out. Jesus. Your presence is heaven. Your presence is heaven to me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Your presence is heaven. We say, oh, yeah. oh, Jesus, your presence is heaven to me, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, your presence is heaven to me. Like you, Lord, in all the earth. Come on, sing it out. Match yourself. Match just love and beauty in this world. Nothing in this world can satisfy. You need to say this part loud. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Lord, your friend. atmosphere in this place. You're here with us right now, Lord. Treasure 
Same thing. Oh. 